Thank you very much indeed. I, I was given this, this topic, palliative care, why bother? And, and giving me such an open canvas is a really risky thing to do. Uh, uh, so I, I need to make a declaration and I need to say some thanks. My declaration is uh, I am an enthusiast. So always beware when someone is an enthusiast because they may not be completely objective, uh, but palliative care is something which is very important to me. The, the tr palliative care tree of supporting the family, treating the person, promoting quality of life, affirming life really means a great deal. And it's, it's where I find my home in medicine and it's where I feel there's a great deal that we can do. Um, I say need to say thank you. Thank you for being asked to come back to, to uh, Craig Avon and thank you for the opportunity of today. What I was planning to do over this next 40 minutes is a little bit of the background about why palliative care is important. Then personally, why bother? Globally, why bother? Locally, why bother? Professionally, why bother? And then organizationally, why is palliative care so important? That's what I kind of plan to do over this little while. Okay, is that all right? <laughs> so uh, thinking about why bother, I want to tell you Karen's story. Uh, I tell it with her permission and the permission of her husband. Because Karen came into our hospice uh, at the end of last summer. And she came in with a very specific goal. Her goal was to get built up because Karen had advanced bowel cancer. She thought by coming into the hospice and getting built up, she would be able to go forward for chemotherapy, which would give her her chance for spending more time with her two girls, aged nine and four. But when Karen came into us, it was clear from her uh, COAS notes, it was clear from examining her, it was clear from speaking to the oncologists that there were no more oncology options. And, and yet Karen was, was really focused on that. So what, what did we do? Well, we, we, we worked at improving her symptoms, her pain, her nausea, her sleep, getting her bowel function going properly, making her feel a lot more comfortable. But then there was the much more difficult issue of conversation of speaking to Karen. The nurses were very nervous. We can't take away her hope. And yet she was looking out for something that was never going to happen. And so over two or three conversations, we explained to Karen that treatment was not an option, that time was short, and she was devastated. She didn't speak for a couple of days. She didn't want to speak to her girls. We thought, had we made a, the wrong mistake? You know, had we done the wrong thing? And then all of a sudden, Karen kicked into gear. Memory boxes were made. Uh, Andy was given umpteen uh, lists to fill and things to do. An event was organized. The Merchant Hotel came, and they, we, we over, did the outpatients department. And there was a tent built, and they had a night together, all the family all together. Karen achieved a huge amount. She died uh, just about a week after this photograph was taken. This photograph was one of the last things on her list of things to do for her girls. After she died, we discovered she'd arranged for her eyes to be donated and for the tumor in her stomach, in her, in her liver, to be sent to Leeds to try to help others not go through what she went through. All of those things would not have happened were it not for palliative care. Palliative care controlling her symptoms, palliative care having the conversation, palliative care supporting her and her family at that time. Is it important? I think it's very important. Uh, so uh, some background. These are the latest global death rates. Uh, they haven't changed since time began. And uh, as far as I know, there's no uh, pending change uh, in the next few years because uh, everybody is going to die. It's 100% in every country of the world. So this, is, this isn't somebody else's concern. This is 
our concern. This is our family's concern. This is our parents' concern. This is our children's concern. How do we make sure that that life journey, that important part of life, uh, because palliative care is about life, it's not about dying, that the really important part of life is lived as well as possible. I personally became involved in palliative care when working in a hospital in rural Nepal. And uh, uh, you can tell it was a long time ago because there was some <laughs> hair. <laughs> not very much, but there was some. It was good to know that it could be there. Uh, but I was seeing patient after patient who was coming with huge charts from all over North India, coming up to see the white doctors uh, in, the, in the mission hospital, and they had spent umpteen rupees, money that they didn't have, they'd often sold their fields, looking for treatments which were never going to cure them. Uh, so many people uh, dying on trains in North India, even today, looking for futile treatments. This lady had come with advanced cervical cancer. And the great message, if you like, I was able to give her, great message, but it was a very important message, was that her, treat, her disease was not curable, that she needed to go back home. She needed to be in her own place. She needed to sort out her children. She needed to make the decisions which she could make while she could make them for her family and for uh, her life. And, and that's so important. Palliative care is important. And large numbers of patients are palliative right from the, the point of, of diagnosis right across the world. This is important stuff. Globally, um, I, I've been traveling a lot this year to Kazakhstan, to India, to Uruguay. And these countries, they look to us, to, to Ireland, as a leader in palliative care. And the issues which they are facing are the same issues that we face uh, in, in trying to secure good quality ends of life. 56 million people globally die per year. 44 million of these in resource-limited countries. 60% would benefit from palliative care input. Globally, it's a huge issue. But how many actually receive such care? We're all going to have to deal with our own mortality. We're all dying. And uh, the question before us is, how are you and I going to die? In the vast majority of the developing world, there are millions of people who are dying in pain every day. There is an enormous crisis in untreated pain, and the reason that it makes it such a crisis is that pain is such a treatable problem. 65% of people suffering with HIV AIDS are in Africa. How are these people going to access pain medication? All around the world, people are suffering unnecessarily. Undertreated pain is clearly a prominent and real issue. Anybody that's watched somebody that they love die, in pain, never leaves them. We all have the right to die with dignity and in peace and pain free, and unfortunately the reality is that that's not the case. In the United States, uh, only about 60% of people undergoing active cancer treatment get satisfactory relief for their pain. People who actually die of cancer in nursing homes, 25% of them get nothing more than Tylenol. Acute pain, such as pain after surgery or trauma, is only managed effectively in 50% of people. Do we have a drug that's 100% effective? And yet, at every corner, there is a challenge to the availability of these drugs. It's important globally, hugely important globally. Okay? And yet, the essence of palliative care is really simple. Umpteen studies done across the world comes up with the same list of things that people want towards the end of life. What do they want? They want somebody they can trust, someone who can help navigate the journey, someone to, to, to accompany them, somebody to, who's been there before, who can guide and direct and be a midwife for that important part of life. They want close family beside them 
or, or close to them to support and help them at that time. They want good symptom control. They want their pain to be controlled, their nausea to be controlled. They want to be free from unpleasant symptoms. They want to be in a, in a safe or in a familiar place, a safe or familiar place. For many, that will be home. For others, that will be hospital or a hospice or nursing home. Uh, but it's, it's, it's their place of choosing. And the majority of people, they want the opportunity to plan. In Nepal, it was so that they could sort out, get, get their daughters married, work out the goats, what was going to happen to the goats and the land. And, and in, in Ireland, I suspect it's a little bit different. But the opportunity to plan, to make choices, why you still can make choices, is really important. Those are kind of universals across the world. How can we deliver that? They look simple, but they require quite complex management to actually bring those things about because our healthcare systems tend to be system-centered rather than patient-centered. What do they want? Treatment, high-quality treatment. Palliative care isn't about hand-holding or uh, kind of waffly stuff. Palliative care is about the application of evidence-based medicine in a compassionate way. Okay. So Dame Cicely Saunders, she put it like this, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. And we will do all that we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to live until you die. Because the dying part of life is an important part of life. Uh, so why bother locally? Uh, this is uh, one of the campaign posters from uh, the All-Ireland Institute campaign last uh, October, highlighting the importance of palliative care locally, making the most of precious time, living life to the full, making the most of life, planning ahead. Key messages, nothing about death or dying there, all about giving life new meaning and new strength as people face difficult times. Really important messages. Why do we bother? Because it's important. Professionally, why do we bother? Um, this is my new guru, <laughs> Atal Gawande. Maybe some of you heard him speaking the, at the Wreath Lectures. Really uh, insightful. And he's a surgeon as well. <laughs> um, um, don't hold that against him. Um, he, he's an endocrine surgeon from Harvard. Writes in the New Yorker and the New York Times. Uh, but he highlights in his book, Being Mortal, the real dilemma of modern medicine. That we are now able to do so much, but that ability to do so much can allow us to create Frankenstein situations where we don't know when to stop doing what we can do. And he highlights in his books lots of stories of doctors and with patients who struggle. Some of the, some of the comments he highlights here. Uh, I didn't come into medicine to let people die. There's that kind of fighting spirit, fight, 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 fight. But if we fight beyond the point when it's appropriate to fight, we end up hurting people, hurting families. While there's life, there's hope. I've seen patients who everybody thought were dying, who recovered, who are able to enjoy life now. Absolutely. And if you work in specialties like hematology or cardiology, you can really identify with that. But the risk of treating everybody to the nth degree is also a risk. It's important not to remove hope for patients and family. I feel, again, this quite strongly because sometimes people come to us uh, in palliative land, and they've been told, I'm afraid there's nothing more we can do. We'll have to send you to palliative care. It, it, it's not a great start to, 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 to build the relationship. Um, and, and, and there isn't an, an expectation that in palliative care that we will be able to do everything. One of the joys of working in palliative care is I think it's the only specialty where we can always do something, always do something which makes a little bit of a difference. We're a very positive specialty. 
families often ask me not to tell patients in case they give up. Yeah, we, we've had that as well. And, and, but, but is that an excuse for doctors to enter into collusion uh, just because it might involve some difficult communication? It's too early to refer to palliative care. Well, I've heard that one before. A patient in with a doctor. Doctor, you know, my disease is getting on. Do you think it would be helpful to be referred to palliative care? And some of our colleagues saying, oh, no, no, no. It's far too early for that. Uh, and that's really sad because really uh, it's never too early in many respects for involvement of your palliative care team and, and working with them. Um, and yeah. And lastly, patients have come to rely on me over the years, and I haven't given up on them. And Atul, he tells a story of this oncologist who had looked after a lady with advanced ovarian disease. He'd taken her through first line, second line, third line, fourth line <coughs> chemotherapy. And he felt he couldn't stop because his relationship with her had always been one of, 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 of success. And so rather than having the conversation and saying, actually, I've come to the end, there, there aren't further oncological treatments, he ended up giving her fifth-line chemotherapy, for which he knew there wasn't any hope at all of, of success. But that kind of relationship had been built up, and he couldn't break out of it. So modern medicine has many dilemmas. It's achieved a huge amount, but it needs palliative care to help counteract some of the over excesses that we are all potentially prone to. And that the referral to palliative care is not a referral uh, of, of desperation. It's a, ref it's a referral based out of a love for life and ensuring that life is lived to the max, to the end. Uh, professionals struggle with understanding what palliative care is, and the professional struggle with understanding what it is, how difficult can it be then for, for, for patients, for families? And it all gets mishmashed up with uh, Dr. Shipman and euthanasia and all the stuff that you can hear uh, Stephen Nolan or some other TV show or radio show talking about, and people get very confused about it. Is it giving up? Is it hand-holding? Is it unscientific? And it's none of those things because of the evidence, the science, the hard work that's gone in to creating a specialty. When, when Dame Cicely Saunders began, she began uh, as a nurse, as a social worker who perceived a huge need. But she was wise enough to appreciate that right from the beginning, she needed to have an evidence research base. And so almost her first appointment was Robert Twycross to come and do research. The evidence is there that what we do is valuable, is important, and is scientifically proven. But it's difficult because of the transitions. And moving from one transition to another is a challenge for, 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 for modern medicine. Uh, we're treating, 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 treating. When does the point come when maybe we say, well, maybe our goal should no longer be curative, but palliative. How do you make that jump? And then once you're in the palliative land, how do you make the jump from our goals should no longer be you know, a, a purely caring, supporting? When does our, our goals change to supporting end of life and supporting the dying time? And those transitions are difficult because they require both clinical skills, but also communication skills to be able to transfer that, uh, that information to families so that people are traveling together. I, I loved obstetrics in Nepal, and I see obstetrics in palliative care is very similar. In many ways, you're kind of like a midwife, birthing somebody at the end of life, birthing somebody in new life, uh, and it's a, it's a human process. You can never be quite sure when that baby's going to come. You can never be quite sure when that person's going to, going to go. Because being born and dying, they're not medical events. They're human events, human events that we can accompany people on to try to make them as good as possible. I, I thought this slide was really interesting. And, and it shows that the dilemma of modern medicine. This was a study done by Joanne Lynn in the States 
I heard term terminal sedation. We wouldn't use that term. Uh, what we really mean is, is the use of a little bit of benzodiazepine to reduce anxiety. And so she asked uh, several hundred physicians across America, and she asked them, if you were in the last days of life, would you yourself like a little bit of benzodiazepine just to help with any anxiety or stress at that time? 98% of those physicians said that they would. And then they were also asked, how often have you prescribed such benzodiazepines for your patients? And the answer was less than 2%. So what doctors want for themselves, they are nervous about prescribing for their patients. And there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, societal, how this will be interpreted, and all those communication difficulties. But we need to get beyond that to ensure that the sort of care that we would want for ourselves is the sort of care that our patients receive. Uh, this is another really important reason why palliative care is important. This study, lots of palliative care people point to it, but it was the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a, a few couple of years ago. They did a study looking at 151 patients who had early uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. And they were divided into two groups, those who received kind of standard care and those who received standard care plus palliative care. And why this study was really important was that it showed that patients, not only did they uh, enjoy better quality of life, not only was there less depression, they lived longer. <laughs> People did better. They lived longer with palliative care. That doesn't fit the script. You're supposed to die with palliative care. Here's a paper saying you live longer with palliative care. How does that work out? Well, if your symptoms are well controlled, if you're not in pain, if you're not nauseated, um, then you've got more energy for living. And, and it, this paper documents what we have perceived and seen in hospices, in uh, hospital palliative care units, in care homes for many years, that when people are comfortable and settled and emotionally settled, they do much better than when their symptoms are poorly controlled. But it's the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the closest thing to kind of biblical medical truth. So it's an important paper to have. So what about standards? You know, how do we assess the quality of our care? And what impact does palliative care have on setting, say, the standards in Craig Avon Hospital or the standards in the unit where you are working? I think having palliative input is really important in these other areas. Otherwise, the goals of care can <coughs> become very uh, figure orientated as opposed to person-centered. Uh, uh, this is the kind of standard that I would be looking for, that uh, if this were my mother, if this were my father, if this were my grandmother, or if this were me, would I be content with the quality of end-of-life care that they received? And if, when I walk away, when I reflect on the care that somebody who I loved uh, had received, and I think that wouldn't have been good enough for my own family, then that's a huge opportunity for us to reflect on how we could do it better, how we could make it better. I, I, I have kind of learned uh, the hard way, uh, I guess, that success doesn't teach you very much. You can write books, you can publish papers, you can have all sorts of fancy invitations, doesn't really teach you very much. What really teaches us is when we make mistakes, is when things go wrong. That is the gold that, can that we can take and transform. And if we've got procedures which allow us to look at our care closely and well, so that when things don't go well, rather than feeling all defensive, we can look and see so that we don't just keep on repeating the same mistakes. One of the opportunities of palliative care. Uh, 
I, I don't know whether you can see this, it's, it's our failures which teach us most. Very dark, but there's somebody hanging there with their head inside the, 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 the luggage. So, so the guy's been trying to close the thing on somebody's head. But metaphorically, that's what often what, what we're doing. Uh, you've seen that. Someone has a bad death in hospital or in hospice because of particular things. And those things are there a few days later. And the same thing happens. And those things are there a few weeks later. And the same thing happens. And those things are there a few months later. And the same thing happens. Because there hasn't been learning within the system. And what palliative care, I hope, has got to offer is a safe community, a safe environment where bad things can be analyzed and looked at so we don't repeat them. What does palliative care offer? Well. It offers, I'm going to suggest, four big things. It offers good quality symptom control. Uh, control of pain, nausea, uh, distress, delirium, respiratory disease. Wide range of symptom control for malignant disease, uh, for patients with malignant disease and patients with non-malignant disease. A wide range of symptom control. What else does palliative care offer? Good communication. Lots of training and communication for palliative care professionals, sharing decision making, accompanying patients, really important good communication. Uh, working with patients to, to work out what they want, what they're prepared to put up with, what they're prepared not to put up with. Working with them to, to try to, to, to develop a way forward. Disease management, managing diseases. Correcting the correctable. Uh, uh, often we, we have patients who, who come into us who uh, we're told they're in the last kind of days of life, but when we look at them, when we, when we uh, do some tests, we can see maybe if we check their calcium, or maybe if we improve their cardiac drugs, or maybe if uh, with just the application of good quality medicine, uh, windows can be opened which give patients more time, um, more valuable time. And, uh, and working that out is really important. Good quality disease management. Patients and families really appreciate it. And then end of life care, that really special kind of labor ward period of, of palliative care. Uh, again, good communication, supporting families, and helping families who maybe have never been through that journey before or haven't been through that journey for a long time, helping them know what they should be doing, what they should be expecting, what they, uh, how they can contribute and help and support their loved one on that really important period of their lives. And then bereavement care. Uh, again, supporting families, not jumping in and saying, we're the experts, we can help you with bereavement, stand back, because we know and lots of studies have shown us that that doesn't work. But to be a net supporting families, supporting individuals, and their supporting structures, so that when uh, individuals are running into to problems, when they're not adapting back to, to life without their loved one, that we can be there and refer them into the appropriate resources. So four things, symptom control, communication, disease management, end of life care. Uh, so, palliative care is for, for any age. We have uh, children's palliative care, we've got neonatal palliative care, we've got geriatric palliative care, uh, any age. Any activity, palliative care has a place in surgery and anesthesia, and renal medicine, dermatology, any organ, <laughs> heart, <laughs> uh, skin, where your people we can be part, palliative care can be part of any organ situation, any location. 
uh, palliative care is very appropriate in intensive care <coughs> units, very appropriate in emergency rooms, very appropriate in villages, very appropriate in cities, because it's where people live the last period of their lives, where people need good symptom control, where people need important conversations, where people need uh, a palliative, holistic approach. Any illness, these are the kind of standard uh, trajectories that we talk about. The cancer trajectory, this is function, this is time, and classically palliative care becomes involved around about here, uh, at the, in the middle of the, the last year of life, and this is all kind of, kind of much more organized, if you like, because it's a little bit more predictable. Uh, but in organ failure, palliative care also has a really important function. You see in the last year of life, people with organ failure, like heart failure, or respiratory failure, th their function has already deteriorated a good bit. And really palliative care probably has a, has a part to play around this time. This is the patient who's not feeling so well, has a chest infection, is brought in acutely into Craig Avon emergency room. They quickly give him the antibiotics. Patient comes back, not quite as good as the last time, but, but not, not so bad. Next time, again, do a really good job, got to the ward that time, uh, antibiotics brought them back. Next time, again, not coming back quite as well. Next time, oh, they didn't do well. And that's the point when the complaint goes into the hospital that somebody must have made a mistake because they brought daddy back every one of those other times and they didn't bring daddy back then. And the reason, well, if palliative care may be being involved at this time when the person had the same prognosis as at this time, then maybe some important conversations could have been had that actually daddy's prognosis was probably worse than if daddy had cancer with his heart failure at that stage, at that point. And so we're thinking different models of palliative care, maybe working alongside our chronic disease <laughs> colleagues, helping a little bit with symptom control, helping a little bit with conversations, and then backing off, moving in, backing off. And the same in the dementia kind of trajectory, where, again, function even lower still, very hard to assess prognostically what's happening, but really important to make sure that important conversations are had, that important documentation is, is present so that um, patients are not scooped against their will out of homes or out of care homes into acute settings to spend the last hours of their life against their wishes and against the wishes of the family. So lots of really important things where palliative care can help, but we don't have to take it over. That's not the deal. The, the deal is working alongside. And any illness, uh, symptom-wise, traditionally palliative care has been linked with cancer. But if we just base it on symptoms, we can see that for non-malignant and malignant heart disease, that symptoms are very similar, be it pain, breathlessness, cough, uh, anorexia, constipation, insomnia, or depression. Whether you've got s cancer of the lung or COPD, the symptoms, by and large, are the same. And so our expertise, our knowledge can help, irrespective of where the person has got cancer or hasn't got cancer. At any location, uh, palliative care in the ICU, palliative care in the home. Really important that palliative care provides access at the point of need, not just due to a postcode or to a, a place where we expect palliative care to be. So, uh, organizationally, why should we bother with palliative care? And I think this is really important because in our medicine establishment, I think we've got currently a real mismatch and we're only beginning to address that mismatch. Our healthcare system, the NHS, when it was set up, was set up as an acute healthcare system. It was set up to fix your broken leg. It was set up to treat your pneumonia. It was set up to deliver your baby. It was set up to do acute medical things. And in many ways, that's the way our hospitals are still today. And yet, 85% of needs now relate to chronic illness. <laughs> to chronic illness. 
uh, and yet our patterns are of acute illness delivery. You, you understand the point that I'm making? And often hospitals treat with an acute care model uh, 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 when the issues are chronic. And so you have patients coming in and out and in and out and in and out of hospital for acute exacerbations of their chronic COPD. Well, actually, it's a long-term chronic process. And palliative care is, reflects this uh, challenge to prevent, to detect, to educate. Because one of the key skills in managing chronic illness is educating patients, is educating families on how to disease manage. It's very different from an acute model. And if we don't strengthen services uh, in the palliative care model with holistic chronic care management, then the number of complaints is going to increase. This morning I was hearing you know, that the NHS is, is held in uh, some of the highest regard uh, uh, than it's ever been held in. And yet, uh, there's a, another set of surveys which would suggest that even though we can do more than we've ever been able to do before, the amount of actual patient satisfaction with our service is not doing so well because people feel we don't communicate as well as what we could, they don't feel involved in the decision making, and because expectations have just rocketed through the roof. So uh, we need the palliative care approach sprinkled throughout our acute medical services to help us with our communication, to help us with our advanced disease planning, to help us with our transitioning from different levels of care, to help us as we interrelate with other services so that the hospice doesn't become like a, a car or the hospital doesn't become a, a carbuncle in the face of the health service but becomes an integrated part of the whole health service linking with community and hospital so that those barriers are much less than what they currently are. Organizationally, why bother? This was uh, a review of the Liverpool Care Pathway and the complaints made about end-of-life care. Uh, what do people com complain about, about the sort of end-of-life care that is being delivered in the UK uh, in the year 2013? They complained that no one had ever told them that mummy was dying, that those conversations hadn't been happening. And so uh, really important conversations within families did not take place, and people felt really angry about that. Uh, people complained because they didn't feel the system was caring. They felt they were being treated as a number, or as a dementia patient, as opposed to Mrs. McGarry, who all her life ran a wee sweet shop off the Coleraine Road. Yeah? You don't know the difference? Symptom management. People complained because Mummy died in pain. Mummy died uh, still nauseated. Mummy died agitated. That symptom control had not been initiated at an appropriate level. That really angered families. Concerns around clinical care, including the withdrawal of treatment. Uh, families complained that drips suddenly disappeared and no one had been told why the drip had been taken down. Or drip suddenly appeared, and nobody was told why the drip suddenly appeared. And the family uh, then being told, well, we can't discuss that with you because you're, you're not the patient. And a, a, a very legalistic approach being taken, which families got really angry about. And then the last one, uh, perhaps the most difficult one, uh, that people complained about was the lack of doctors, the lack of nurses. Mummy died and no one came near her for half an hour. The nurses were run off their feet. I've got nothing against the nurses. It's just there weren't enough of them. That was a repeated theme in those complaints. 
So these are things which in 2013 are happening across the UK when it comes to end of life care. These are things which are happening in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the frustrating thing is that I know that within my own institution and probably within your institution, we can deliver palliative care of superb quality. The sort of care that you would want for yourself, you'd want for the person you love the dearest. And we can deliver that brilliantly. And yet we can also deliver poor quality palliative care. It would be, almost be better if we could kind of deliver 80% deliver good quality for everybody. But the fact that we can deliver superb care and also deliver substandard care is almost more troubling that we've got that tension. Uh, and so there's work for us to do to be consistent to make sure that the quality of care that we deliver is good quality and is consistently good quality. And that's where we've, we really have struggled with the removal of the Liverpool Care Pathway, because that was one kind of tool which was used to try to ensure consistency of delivery. And now we don't have Liverpool Care Pathways. We've got uh, Basingstoke Care Pathway, Cardiff Care Pathway, Belfast Care Pathway, Newry Care Pathway, lots of care pathways, lots of different places. It, is this consistency of care? and trying to make sure that the care that we deliver is as good quality, irrespective of the geographic location. Organizationally, why bother? Uh, this is the map I think that we really should, should adhere to. It follows the LCOS model in Northern Ireland, and that linkage with our colleagues in whatever specialty they are, building that trust so our cardiology college trust us that we can help in certain of their patients with certain of their symptoms that our respiratory colleagues can trust us as we work alongside them we do not take over control of the patients that we do not uh, kill patients but that we work alongside to improve the quality of life of patients and that is the model I think which offers most opportunity for really high quality palliative care not relying solely on palliative care, but relying on collaborative working. That's the model which delivers the sort of care that I would want for myself. So uh, I, I don't think you can see this uh, video, so I'm going to leave it. Um, but the, the, the essence behind it is that if you don't look out for palliative care, you will never see it. If you haven't got eyes thinking about palliative care, you will miss it. And so if your whole focus is on stenting coronary arteries, then you may miss the fact that the person that you're thinking about stenting coronary arteries has actually had three stents put in before, is 87 years old, has renal failure, and um, hasn't got long to live. Do you, you understand? We'll move on. So, why bother? Are you bothered? I hope you're bothered. I'm bothered about palliative care. Uh, we've, we've looked a bit about the background. Uh, we've thought about personally why I got involved with palliative care, why I think it's really important globally, how important it is, and that we are looked to as, as world leaders, Ireland and the UK, world leaders in palliative care. Locally, why bother? Professionally, why bother? And organizationally, how important it is that we maintain and develop our palliative care influence subtly through the whole organization to improve the quality of care delivery, decrease complaints, but more importantly, improve the care for patients. So it comes back to, to Karen and to Andy and to her two girls. Um, we need to be bothered so that people like them can benefit from what we can do together. Thank you very much.